All right, please have a seat. We're going to begin. Homosexual marriage and the times. Homosexual marriage and the times. I can remember the first time I was caught in a riptide. Christy and I were in the ocean walking around in the water, and it was a moment when we were being sucked out to sea. This ever happened to you? Uh, we weren't very perceptive. I don't know that I'd even been in the ocean before, but there we were. And I'm pretty sure I saved your life. Now we were dating at the time. We're fighting the riptide, right? We're at the ocean. <clears throat> well, here we are in the water of this world, and part of our job as those who live in it is to know where we are and what we're doing here, and to know where the tides are going, to know where the particularly dangerous currents are. We spent the first session orienting ourselves to the Bible, and this session will orient ourselves to the world around us. So this big first half of this session we'll call understanding the times and the first stop in our answer to that question is from the one who knows the times better than any of us God himself what has God said about the times where are we where are we right now here's some verses about the world first John 5 19 we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. And we can't just blame it on the devil. Ephesians 2.1-3 tells us that we were dead in trespasses and sins in which we formerly walked according to the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of the wrath as the rest of mankind. We're all in this together. And for this reason, Romans 1.18 is true, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Well, this is a sad place, and if this is not sad to you, then you are sad. There are other feelings we can feel about the upside downness of our world, but grief is one of them for the sake of God's name and the good of precious image bearers. It's a sad joint. <clears throat> so that's where we're at according to God. Well, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Why would God put us in a dangerous ocean filled with riptides? If our citizenship is in heaven, what are we doing on earth? We're doing all kinds of things. We might be able to summarize them under two headers. Two headers. We're preparing for heaven, which means we're waiting faithfully. Hebrews 13, 14. We have no lasting city, but we seek the city that's to come. Or 2 Peter 3, 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which The heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Places to come yet. We're not conforming, but we're transforming in Romans 12.1. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And we're suffering persecution as we wait, as we prepare prepare for heaven. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In Luke 9, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. All of this is a preparation for heaven. We're also engaging in this world. We are busy engaging this world. We're preaching. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. Job number one, folks. Acts 1, 8, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to where the ends of the earth. Witnesses of Jesus sent. We're persuading people. 1 Corinthians 9.22, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. And a chapter later, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. So being careful to live in this world in such a way as to not offend, certainly the gospel offends, but not to live in such a way that offends unnecessarily, becoming all things to all people. And we're participating Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. (coughs) You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we're waiting for heaven because this is a tragic place and we don't belong here and we know it. And we're being prepared for heaven. And we're engaging this world now because God has put us here with a purpose. To preach the gospel, to persuade with our lives, and to participate in shaping the world around us. Jesus has these twin realities in his mind when he prays on the night of his rest. In John 17, 14 and following, he prays, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of this world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. All of this is more important than we might think, these twin realities. And much of the confusion and conflict between Christians and churches and traditions comes down to how we manage the balance and the relationship of our waiting for heaven and our engagement with the world around us and our role down here. John Piper, I think, is a faithful guide here. And he sums up these twin realities in a sermon he delivered in 2004 when things were going down in Minnesota. With marriage, a sermon called Discerning the Will of God Concerning Homosexual Marriage. So let's listen to this articulate and clear and biblically faithful pastor and consider what we're doing here. He says, I consider these two sides of the Christian life, the pilgrim side and the indigenous side. Pilgrims know they don't fit in. This is not our primary home. We're out of step, out of sync with the culture. On the other hand, We're called to be indigenous, taking on some measure of the culture where we live. If we simply conform to the culture, we would not be salt and light to the culture. If we don't conform at all, the salt would remain in the salt shaker and the light under a basket. On the indigenous side, we should be involved in the process of lawmaking. We should pray and work to shape our culture, its customs and laws, so that it reflects the revealed will of God. Even if that reflection is only external, and dim and embraced by unbelievers with wrong motives. Thus we should pray and work that marriage would be understood and treated in our land and by our government as a lifelong union of one man and one woman. On the pilgrim side of the tension, we make our Christ-exalting, Christ-centered, soul-saving, biblical worldview known with broken-hearted joy. Joy because Christ really is the sovereign Lord of the universe and will establish justice and purity in due time out of this fallen world and brokenhearted because we share in the pain and misery of what sin has brought on this world. We ourselves, Paul writes, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. The pilgrims groan with the whole creation as we witness to our true homeland, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We do not smirk at the misery of the merrymaking of immoral culture. We weep. Being pilgrims does not mean being cynical. The salt of the earth does not mock rotting meat. Where it can, it saves and seasons. Where it can't, it weeps. Being Christian pilgrims in American culture does not end our influence. It takes the swagger out of it. We don't get cranky when evil triumphs for a season. We don't whine when things don't go our way. We are not hardened with anger. We understand what's happening here is not new. The early Christians were profoundly out of step with their culture. The imperial words of Christ were ringing in their hearts. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's a good word, isn't it? So with that, let's consider the times we're in right now. 
We've thought big picture, kind of framework for thinking about the Christian's role in this age. Now let's talk about what exactly is going on out there. <clears throat> We're made in God's image, capable of some remarkable things, even remarkable good, even if fallen short of God's glory. But there are tw- 14 flashpoints in the news from the last half century that aren't so encouraging to help us see what is the progressive suppression of truth. We'll call it that. Remember Romans 1? We suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Some of the headlines reflect a progressive suppression of truth. I'm going to try to follow a thread, the, the culture's sexual ethic, ethic and evolution. Flashpoint number one, Sigmund Freud and sexual identity. So I'll say what happened and then I'll say what it means. 1905, Sigmund Freud presented his work, three essays on the theory of sexuality, including his theory on psychosexual development. He believed that all people start bisexual and develop in one way or another. And this is the beginning of the develop of development of sexual identities, the idea that your gender identity would be detached from your biology, that you aren't a, you're somehow, and it seems to imply you're some kind of embodied, you're like in the body, but you were something else. That's not a Christian view of the human person. But uh, there's a seed right here of that. It grows into full bloom uh, much later. Flashpoint number two. The pill and the sexual revolution. What happened on May 9th, 1960, the pill was introduced. Writing about the pill on its 50th anniversary, Nancy Gibbs in Time Magazine wrote, it arranged the furniture, it rearranged the furniture of human relations in ways that we've ar- argued about ever since. It was the first medicine ever designed to be taken regularly by people who are not sick. The pill became the means by which women united, untied their aprons, scooped up their ambitions, and marched eagerly into the new age. This represents ideas about sex and its relationship to children and marriage that are changing and are still dramatically changing and untied them from one another. Flashpoint three, California adopts no-fault divorce. What happened? Well, 1969, California became the first state to adopt no-fault divorce, which basically means that the dissolution of marriage does not require either party to show wrongdoing. This is easier. You don't have to deal with false testimony and other complications. Well, this law now teaching a new idea about marriage is permanence. It has been shown that the divorce rate went up sixfold within two years after the years of stable divorce rates until that time. And other effects were what's called the feminization of poverty as increasing numbers of women were left without the support of a husband with children without a father, and a general increase in the average marrying age. No matter how unpopular, Christians would have been right to love their neighbors, even yet unborn, in protecting the permanence of marriage in the face of a culture that wanted no-fault divorce. We missed a chance. It's gone. So some things we stop talking about, if we're accused of talking about homosexual marriage at all a lot, it's because there's an opportunity here, right? Flashpoint number four, the first issue of Playboy is released. Okay, so 1953, Hugh Hefner founded Playboy with a $1,000 loan from his mom. Who knew that? Okay, he produced it in his kitchen. It was undated because he didn't even know if it would work out. Uh, Sold out. Thousands of copies. Uh, It was a hit. Changing ideas about the sacredness of sexuality were taking root. And this is the seed from which we now have the pornographied culture. Now everyone can look at the naked bodies of other people's wives and daughters and moms in the privacy of their own home. Flashpoint number five, the DSM redefinition of homosexuality. In 1969, the American Psychiatric Foundation reclassified homosexuality from the sociopath personality disturbance, that's that's what it was called, uh, to sexual deviancy. Uh, 1968, after several years of political pressure and picketing from gay protesters at annual conventions, lots of pressure in 1973, the association removed homosexuality from their diagnostic and statistics manual altogether. It's the DSM. And after huge blowback from within the psychiatric community, it went up for a vote. So, okay, we shouldn't have taken it out because it was taken out on the basis of pressure and that delegitimizes this field as biased as swayed, as unscientific, which is not what they wanted. So it went up for a vote and failed to pass for resubmission with only 40% voting to put it back in as sexual deviancy. And one of the targets on the, the gay rights movement was to change the way it was talked about clinically. 
psychology, doctors, and this was a victory. The fact that uh, of this act represents changing, oh, sorry, um, this teaches us that the scientific community is not without bias or political influence on these matters. Flashpoint number six, the Defense of Marriage Act is signed into the law. 1996, President Bill Clinton signed into law the Defense of Marriage Act after having passed both houses with large majorities. This law restricted the definition of marriage to opposite sex marriages for all federal purposes, including federal marriage benefits, social security survivors benefits, immigration, joint tax returns. I mean, the, the implications for, for this stuff is just huge, is it not? Um, so they have, have to, they have to define this, huge majorities to restrict it to a man and a woman. <clears throat> Practically speaking, these benefits exist in the first place to help hold households, husbands, and wives together with the assumption that children are generally the norm. The state needs marriage to work because it's inside marriage that children come forth and are made responsible and not trouble. The fact of this act represents the changing legal urgency wouldn't have had to do that in the 70s. He had to do it in the 90s. Flashpoint 7, pastor imprisoned for hate speech in Sweden. So in 2004 in Sweden, Pentecostal pastor Ake Green, I think his name is, was sentenced to one month in prison for preaching a sermon that condemned homosexuality as a sin. Thereby, it is said, he was, by virtue of that belief and preaching, stirring up and inciting hatred toward homosexuals. Similar legislation exists in Canada, and similar legislation has been proposed in the States, but hasn't made it through. Ten Kennedy was working on that before he died. And this represents changing ideas about freedom of speech and signals a new assumed right of people not to be offended. If you notice, that's the main right. So from a freedom of speech, we now have the freedom not to hear anything that we disagree with or that offends us. This is not good. <clears throat> There's something going on here at the level of sexuality and the religious liberty stuff, but also just in the transformation of the place we live, the kind of society we are. It's, it's, just, it's, not, it's, uh, it's bad, bad sides. The right not to be offended is a very uh, uh, highly valued right right now. Flashpoint 8, Massachusetts Catholic Charities shuts down. 2006, new state licensing laws in Massachusetts meant that Catholic Charities of Boston, which had been in doing orphan care and adoptions for, I want to say, a century, uh, had to close their doors since it would not agree to place children with homosexual couples. They, were, they had to, or they can't be an adoption agency anymore, and they shut down. In 2000, 2011, and in Illinois, a thousand children were displaced from Catholic Charities foster and adoption programs into secular institutions due to a similar conflict. And this represents changing costs for conscience and an increasing insensitivity on the part of the state for the consciences of its people. You know, the less a people cares for its conscience and obeys its conscience and esteems the conscience, the more cops you need. There's like a guy who wrote this chart out, you know, the, the, for you study nations, you know, the more sensitivity there is to what I think's right and wrong, the less cops you need. The state grows in proportion to the, you know, if, if we're only willing not to do the things that uh, we'd be punished for, uh, that's, that's not a world we want. You generally need people living the right way. Conscience is a precious thing, and we've historically, we've historically guarded this, and it's being trampled, and this is not a good sign either. Flashpoint number nine, California's Prop 8 is struck down. Now, this thing had layers to it. Hit the news at a dozen points. Prop 8, by the way, is basically a mirror of Prop 22, a whole process that California went through in the early 2000s, but a judge shut it down, I think 05 or 06 or something. Prop 8 gets kicked up in around 2008. I'll tell you what happened. 2008, after an expensive and contentious political battle, millions and millions of dollars donated, and still even the uh, Prop 8 supporters were outmatched significantly Dollars-wise, I forget the numbers. Over 7 million California voters, a majority of voters in one of the country's most progressive states, voted to restore the historic definition of marriage for recognition in California. Amazing. Good news. Judge Vaughn Walker, who at the time hid his own same-sex long-term relationship, which he was legally required to disclose since it gives at least the appearance of impropriety, struck down the law as unconstitutional on the grounds with not sufficient explanation that it was just irrational. 
Then Governor Schwarzenegger and Attorney General Jerry Brown, while having sworn an oath to defend the laws enacted by the people of California and trusted to do so, both refused to defend the law the people of California voted to enact. The California Constitution, of course, doesn't let them pick and choose laws to defend, but they did. So the backers of the proposition were left to defend it themselves, an expense of over $10 million before it was all over. The case ended up at the Ninth Circuit's Court of Appeals, sort of a famous court. Stephen Reinhardt, if I have his name right, one of the country's most liberal and most often overturned judges, which is to say this is kind of, he sees himself as this is part of his job, is to uh, stir things up, and the country threw it out. His wife, by the way, an attorney for the ACLU, was secretly advising the plaintiff's lawyers on strategy, we've learned. Before Reinhardt would invalidate Proposition 8, though, he had to determine if the proponents had standing in the first place. That is, since the governor and the attorney general's job was to defend the law, could the people of California actually legally do that? So they consulted with the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court said unanimously, yes, the people of California have standing. So Reinhardt struck it down. The case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court took it. As you may remember, the Supreme Court decided that the people of California did not have standing in the end, which means the Supreme Court didn't have to make a decision either way, which means we know where they would have decided if they decided, but this is a lighter way to move things along, having learned from the Roe versus Wade, the big boom, it's an icon, it's something to respond to. But it was effectively dead. Let's kick back to the, I forgot how it works, but it's effectively dead at that point. And this allowed them in the same day to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act as unconstitutional. So while it was hailed as a symbol of cultural momentum for same-sex marriage, and if you're watching the news, it's just going to look like that. Oh, a victory. Oh, the judge. Oh, this thing happened. It really, we really should say it's more like a form of cultural manipulation that has the effect of cultural manipulation, uh, momentum over time. Proposition 8 represents changing legal atmosphere, a changing legal atmosphere. Flashpoint number 10, California laws, thank you California, Uh, California laws laws allow students to pick bathrooms, okay, you guys, so we're getting closer to home now, I'll do about four or four left and they'll all be pretty tight in the last year and a half. August 2013, California became the first state to require by law all school districts for students K through 12 grade to allow students to decide whichever restroom or locker they desire to use. Governor Jerry Brown signed this into law in part to help cut down on bullying and discrimination against transgender students, he says. Spokesman for the bill, Carlos Alcala, wrote, clearly there are some parents who are not going to like it. Oh, man. We are hopeful school districts will work with them so no students are put in an uncomfortable position. Yeah. Um, Well, this represents the consequences of changing ideas about gender, if anything does. You see how this is all tied together? Sexuality, gender, human nature, marriage, all all this is tied together. Flashpoint 11, Vanderbilt University upends religious groups. Actually, this is probably before the one I just read, but... Got him out of order. Vanderbilt University, a school founded by Christians in the 1870s, informed religious groups that they would need to conform to a non-discrimination policy. So 30 religious groups on campus, many of them Christian, have to conform. I think that's 30 Christian groups on campus. Have to conform to the non-discrimination standards in order to continue as a group on campus. And those those, uh, included uh, uh, non-discrimination against religious beliefs and sexual orientation which means atheists or active homosexuals could not be disqualified for leadership or membership in any of these Christian organizations. See what this does? Bowdoin College in Maine served the volunteer leaders of Bowdoin Christian Fellowship a similar non-discrimination clause a few months ago to sign if someone participating in an organization, as a spokesman says, uh, and they are LGBTIQA, Um, they are not allowed to participate in that organization because of their sexual orientation or they cannot lead that organization because of their sexual orientation and that's discrimination, says the school. So Christians are increasingly unwelcome in the academy and institutions are increasingly coercing the dissolution of Christian partnership and work. This is a form of persecution. And when we suffer these kinds of consequences, we do so for the sake of the name of Jesus in faithfulness to God, learning learning obedience, 
our brothers and sisters in these places. Uh, this is not like persecution in other places where your neck's on the line, but this is not small. It's not insignificant. Flashpoint 12, Arizona. You all should all know what that means. But you're probably all confused about what that means. If you trust almost any news source, you'd probably, uh, I don't know, there's probably a hundred different stories in the room as to what happened in Arizona. A modest bill, honestly, was proposed to allow a sincere claim to religious liberty to be heard in the court on the part of a business, basically updating the Arizona law to match the current federal law signed by President Clinton in 93 and approved by overwhelming majorities in Congress that does the same thing that's still in effect. The law was written already applied to individuals. This update was intended to protect the people, such as photographers or cake bakers, from being required by law to use their artistry to enhance celebration of same-sex union. A legitimate appeal to religious liberty, which would not apply to all kinds of things people said that would happen. The heated discussion within evangelical searches, circles surrounded the question of whether the baker should bake the cake. All kinds of big heated exchanges on whether we should bake the cake and how some guys are ridiculous and some Christians... Wouldn't. It wasn't the issue. The question was whether we have to bake the cake, whether the state can make us bake the cake. That's the issue at stake in Arizona, although the other issue was not irrelevant. The immediate relevant issue is religious liberty um, and conscience. So we have a category for kosher laws, for example. Right? This is similar. The media and activist groups insisted this would open a flood of services denied to homosexuals across the state, uh, all over the place. Such denials would not have a hearing in court, though, and neither is there any sign of anything like this anywhere where similar laws apply. A media that is more and more overly and obnoxiously willing to manipulate reporting for desired political ends, abusing our trust and abdicating their responsibility to hold the state in check is not to be trusted. So that's not everyone. You know, social media hasn't helped this. I read an article that said something like, you know, 10 years ago, the 800-word analysis of what's happening in the news used to be what you were known for. So you're a journalist, process something, digest it, publish it for the next morning, stay up late. Things move so fast now, so fast, there is almost not time for digestion. So you almost get this kind of barf news, just <laughs> storm. So I would encourage you, find columnists you like. Find, I mean, TV isn't real helpful either. Find columnists, find the right, I mean, ask me, I'll tell you what I read, and just read 800-word articles. Uh, it's just better use of your time, and, um, and you won't be confused. Um, I follow Twitter too, so I, but... Um, an aside. So flashpoint number 13, World Vision changes their hiring policy. Now this, is, this happened very recently. It's touched a few of you pretty close. It's a little closer to home. On March 24th of this year, World Vision, one of the nation's largest Christian charities, a fine organization, announced a new hiring policy that would mean they are open to hiring same-sex married couples so long as their union is recognized by the state. People in otherwise adulterous relationships would not meet the code of conduct as historically the case. But homosexuality as aberrant or uh, would be bracketed. This was presented as taking a neutral position on the matter, just like an organization like this would take a neutral position on issues of baptism, divorce and remarriage, for example, not making calls on those for their people. It was bracketed as a culture war issue. That's how World Vision has talked about this issue in the past. Something on which they would defer to the authority of the autonomy of the local churches or their people. The effect, that their position, the effect of their position is to see no contradiction in terms for a person to be practicing homosexuality and be a Christian. But as J.I. Packer has written, uh, there, are, uh, there are ways of sin that, if not repented of and forsaken, will keep people out of the kingdom of God for salvation. And I hope in the first half we settled the question of what the Bible says and the urgency. And I hope you picked up some of the news. Thankfully, in answer to prayer and response to public and private confrontation, it was only two days later that World Vision made a retraction and published a confession and asked for forgiveness. We can all be thankful for that. It's the best we could hope for. And so can many children be thankful. And saying I'm wrong is very difficult and they deserve credit where credit's due. We should have increasingly sober expectations of the future. That's my takeaway. I don't claim to know everything that's going on under the surface here. I'm just reading this from a distance. But World Vision, I would believe, stands to lose big for holding on to its position, this current one, as they receive, I think, a third of their funds from government funding. What happened to Catholic Charities, I think this organization will in time lose its funding. This has happened to other organizations. 
I don't think this was on a whim. Uh, They would have to know there would be stateside consequences for this. I think it was a calculated strategic move to try to get ahead of a change. But the fact that they did it and reversed back is good, but it tells us that people that are watching the, the, the winds know what's coming. So just a heads up, every Christian organization I think will cross this bridge. If you had a Christian organization and you have the opportunity to take government funds, remember they can steer you with those in time. You will be dependent on them. Flashpoint 14, Mozilla ousts their president. So this is the last couple days, you probably caught this. And this is an interesting one, because there was no court case. Um, it was kind of grassroots. Mozilla F- Firefox has a new president. It was found out that eight years ago he gave $1,000 to Majority One Proposition 8 bill. He was forced to resign. The outcry was so strong, social media, and there's a couple organizations online just shaming the organization to a point where either in principle Mozilla got rid of him or they stood to lose too much because of the market pressure of the disapproval out there. And I think it says something about the shifting winds out in the culture that that much noise could be made and have that kind of an impact. The intolerance of tolerance has achieved an amazing irony of history here, has it not? The president's personal views expressed in support of a majority-supported bill eight years ago are unacceptable even at a company whose policies are decidedly open. No tolerance. Part of our problem here is that we're losing open public discourse. People aren't willing to persuade with ideas, but they're willing to coerce with force. That's not the tactic we believe in, but it's the tactic some believe in and they're using it. It's a kind of conversion by sword in a way. We should want the public space free for discussion of diverse ideas, not just for our sake, but because this is right and honors people. And we want them to come to ideas voluntarily and by persuasion. It honors the human being. These tactics don't. It's also American. So how on earth did all this happen? How on earth did all this happen? In fact, the question of culture change is a curious one. The times they are are changing, but how? Uh, I found an article by Joe Carter at First Things to be especially helpful here. It's titled, How to Destroy Culture in Five Easy Steps. Everyone wants to know how to do that. I don't mean to be too dark here, but it's, it's, it's a helpful article. It summarizes the process of cultural change. In the mid-1990s, Joseph P. Overton developed a political theory that's called the Overton Window. This is a window of political possibility along a spectrum of political options. So here I'll read a paragraph. Imagine, if you will, a yardstick standing on end. On either end are the extreme policy actions for any political issue. Between the ends lie all gradations of policy from one extreme to another. The yardstick represents the full political spectrum for a particular issue. The essence of the Overton window is that only a portion of this policy spectrum is within the realm of politically possible at any time. Regardless of how vigorous a think tank or group may campaign, Only policy initiatives within this window of the politically possible will meet with success. There are five points along the continuum where any single policy decision might fall. Unthinkable, radical, acceptable, sensible, popular, and then policy. The follow? To move an issue from unthinkable to radical, you need to have it picked up by the academy as a fetish topic. They live on the theoretical and the novel. To move an issue from the radical to acceptable, you need a euphemism. Partial birth abortion is called dilation and extraction, extraction, for example. Call homosexuality gay, adopt the rainbow as a symbol. Most importantly, talk a lot about love. Okay? I mean, these are people thought this up. It's not just that the language that's around us was calculated. Bring the resistant along with language of bigotry. Plenty of people will come along. Bigotry will help the rest. The accusation of hate has quieted many Christians from simply saying what he or she believes. Maybe even believing it in time. In her article, Dissecting Political Correctness, Stella, I can't read her last name, Maura Betodes, uh, does just that. She speaks of saturation and suppression. So saturation is the the practice of repeating a deception relentlessly and injecting into every corner of public life so that it becomes accepted as truth. Saturation usually requires the control of most communication outlets. No matter how implausible the idea may seem, it can gain acceptance in the minds of citizens as the forces of PC, political correctness, relentlessly hype the idea in the public square. Simultaneously, the voices that might challenge or analyze the idea must be suppressed 
Accusations of bigotry and hatred often actually do the trick so that the politically correct idea has a chance to incubate and then affect public opinion. The twin processes of saturation and suppression, if diligently applied, can produce the illusion of a huge public opinion shift or a cascade. And the word is illusion, because it's not always there yet, but it ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm saying all this so that you know how to live wisely in the world and know how to hear what you're hearing. And not to be defeated or discouraged either, necessarily. A two-pronged approach to persuasion lulls some to sleep through exhaustion, the feeling of inevitable defeat. It convinces many who want to be on the popular side of an issue to avoid conflict with colleagues and friends by even talking about it. And there is a snowball effect here. And in addition to cultural intimidation like this, dissenters are also disparaged when it is implied that the movement is monolithic. There are, for example, respected gay identifying figures who for various reasons oppose homosexuality. I've read great articles by a guy who grew up with two moms who's pro-homosexual marriage who says this was bad and he studied it. Um, there's a number of books and articles like that you don't hear them anywhere. So when you have uh, figureheads that represent the group and make the group appear monolithic, that also has the effect of cultural force and momentum and pushing the, the, the agenda along. To move it from acceptable to sensible, you have to tie the matter to a cultural god. In our case, the individual and self-expression, co-opt science and psychology into redefining the thing. And from sensible then to popular, you need to personalize the issue, put a face to it. How can you hate these people? From popular to policy is the last stop, and this is where we are today with homosexual marriage. Politicians are motivated to keep their jobs, and they're in too many instances too vulnerable to peer pressure as seventh grade boys. Unprincipled. Not all of them, of course. In a book by Linda Hirschman telling the story of the gay rights movement, we learn about this movement, why it was so successful in such a short time. From the beginning, the movement has insisted on more than blacks or women sought in their respective movements. Gays insisted not just on tolerance or equal rights, but on approval and admiration. She writes, it is the moral certainty of the gay revolution that explains why, unlike the racial and feminist movements, uh, it has been able to stand up and prevail over the religious counterforce in American society. Theologically speaking, I want to say what's going on here is just a lot of Romans 1. One explanation for the force of the movement is the religious power of sex and the idea that we are our sexual identities and desires. That is hard to let go. Romans 1, sexual Im uh, immorality is the step that immediately follows the exchange of God's glory for the creature. Is truth for a lie, at least in the course of that narrative. It should be no surprise that the abandonment of one's faith is bound up with this his running into the arms of a forbidden lover, and that happens time and again. Our worship of God and our sexual lives are tightly wound. So the religious dimension here, and this religion's agent of conversion, is the state. And that's why scholars who support gay marriage and those who don't like it acknowledge an open secret. By the way, that is, the goal is not ultimately expand marriage, but to dismantle marriage as an institution. This is documented. So there was the commitment to dismantle a Judeo-Christian conception of gender, sexuality, and marriage long before there was an agenda for homosexual marriage. That movement locked on to homosexual marriage as the means to undoing marriage as an institution. Do you guys see this? You ever heard that before? This is new to me this last year. It makes sense. I, I really need to ferret it out farther, but the, the references I've read in the books that, just, that I've seen referenced, I, I, I think it makes sense. The institution of marriage ties sex to monogamous marriage and sex to kids. For those who believe gender and sexuality in marriage are a social construct, homosexual marriage legislation is a backdoor to a broader agenda. So our agent of change is not the state, ours is the word of God, isn't it? We don't use the same tools. So we have a place in the political process and we have a responsibility here, but ours is the preaching of the word of God. We care about souls. It's much deeper than what the state can do. Right? So we preach, we talk, we're not, we're not without that. We live our faith, we speak it, we do it all in love. We don't return evil for evil, but return evil with good. We need to be as ferocious about our marriages and about our Lord and our gospel as this movement has been about its goals. All right? They show up and pick it, we can start conversations with our neighbors. Psalm 4-7, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and new wine abound. 
and he has. So questions then, questions. All right, let's tear into it. These are largely questions about the state's responsibility with respect to marriage. So last session we'll talk mostly about our responsibility. There'll be a little overlap here. First question, should government legislate morality? That assumes that legislation and morality are different things. This question comes up a lot. I asked this question in 2004, standing in the hall, talking to my pastor. And he gave me almost just this answer, and I thought about it, and he was right. Yes, it should. All governments do. The question is, whose morality? The question is, whose morality? Of course, the state handles all kinds of things related to particular stuff, like stoplights. But the second you get any deeper than that, you're dealing with what humans are, what goodness is, what right and wrong is, lying, theft, murder, all of that assumes a certain view of human beings. And if you just think we should take it all for granted, just go to different parts of the world. Go to India. The handicapped can be left for dead. Why? Because caste system and reincarnation, it's a mess. Worldview. We assume certain things about human beings in this culture. We take them for granted. Uh, it's morality. Murder, theft, breaking contracts, sexual abuse. It's about controlling people's behavior according to a certain vision of what behavior is right and good and wrong and good for society. So the question is not, what does, what does the government uh, does the government legislate morality, but whose morality do they legislate? Next question. Should the government regulate marriage? Why is it in the marriage business at all? And I, I realize as I'm stepping further into this that I'm getting further into where Christians are discussing these things. So just take that. This is, these aren't official stances on a part of your church. That first session especially is. But should the government regulate marriage? Assumption is that marriage is a sacred institution and the government shouldn't involve itself with sacred things or the assumption is that marriage is a private interpretation for the government should leave it alone to groups in the states to regulate. Short answer is that marriage is a basic to human flourishing in such a way that it creates social goods that the government could not produce by any other means and that the society absolutely needs to survive. Long answer, the government isn't in the business of managing or regulating other kinds of relationships. There's no friendship certificates, for example. So why, uh, why, why is the state involved in this one? Right? They've always been, so we just assume it. But why? Why are they involved in it? Because when a man and a woman come together, they create another human life. And it's in the state's interest to do whatever it can to hold those parents together for the sake of that child and the sake of everyone else. Um, pastor buddies all over the country, we call each other for advice. So I got two calls this week. Um, I forgot what one of them was about. One of them, uh, sorry, they were both good illustrations. One of them, uh, um, Cal confesses that uh, she's raped by her older brother. A very similar call from a pastor buddy. You might not hear, you hear stuff in the news. Uh, depending on your line of work, you might come into this stuff. People are dangerous. Boys without dads are really dangerous. The state's smart to regulate marriage, to hold men and women together, to incentivize them with tax credits and all kinds of ways to help make this thing float and work. Stabilize it. When a man and woman come together, they create a human life. Marriage between a husband and wife is not the only way humans are made. My wife is not only, only the way. <laughs> so in 2014, there are other ways, but okay, uh, it's not only the way human beings are made, but the way that humans are made responsible givers and not takers, contributors, not criminals. It's in the state's interest, so that's the point. So why, next question, why should we expect the state to recognize our particular view of marriage? Should we impose our religious views on society? This is a good question. I hope you're asking this question. Assumption is that marriage is a social construct, though, and that its meaning is a matter of individual interpretation. It could change over time. The short answer to that question is it's not just ours. It's everyone's. This is obviously related to the previous question. Why would we impose our view of marriage on the rest of society? Is that really our place? The crucial question here, though, is what is marriage? There are two competing views in this discussion. There haven't been, but there are now the comprehensive view where marriage is a comprehensive union. This is the view that has been held by civilizations anywhere until about 10 years ago. The revisionist view is that marriage is an emotional union. This is the view held by those who suggest that two of the same sex can be married. Remember the illustration of a nut and a bolt. How can you marry a nut and a nut or a bolt and a bolt? Something else has to be marrying something else has to be attaching 
because there isn't a natural uh, fit. Um, so an emotional union is what, I love this person, I'm in love, I want a family. Andrew Walker has said it so well, while marriage may be ultimately Christian, it is not exclusively Christian. It's not like baptism, it's for everyone. And there aren't two kinds, secular and sacred, even if Christians do it right or should do it right or know where it comes from. In the same way that the gender categories of male and female fit the world, marriage is presented in the Bible fits the world because the Bible tells the truth about the world. That's why Romans 1, it says they're without excuse. It's so plain in creation that some of our sins leave us without excuse. We didn't need a written word from God to know this is wrong. Consider consider these four realities that explain the social importance of marriage. This is what marriage is based on. Men and women go together. Men and women, when they go together, make children. Men and women are responsible for the children they make. And children have a basic right, and as far as it's possible, to know and be raised by the mother and the father who created them. And children are not a part of the national conversation right now, if if you've been listening. They're just not. They're not a part of it. Biologically and historically, we're in strong company. Sociologically, we should not be surprised to find that the breakdown in marriage norms is particularly bad for kids. Marriage, according to research by Robert Rector of the Heritage Foundation, is the greatest weapon against child poverty. It drops by 82% when both parents are in homes. Nearly three-fourths of poor families in the U.S. are headed by single parents. This is just one touch point in the life of a child. That is poverty. The best thing anyone can do for a kid is see that his mom and his dad stay together. Numerous studies demonstrate that children in a home with a married mother and father do exceptionally better on all accounts. This is not to um, think ill or less of or not commend those of you who are raising children on your own. You should be highly esteemed and commended and supported here. I hope the facts are just as are plain to us. Ryan Anderson confirms that studies that control for other factors, including poverty, genetics, suggest that children uh, reared in intact homes do best in terms of educational achievement, emotional health, familial and sexual development, and delinquency and incarceration. He continues, the marital breakdown harms society as a whole. A Brookings Institute study found that $229 billion in welfare expenditures between 1970 and 96 can be attributed to the breakdown of marriage culture and the resulting exacerbation of social ills, including teen pregnancy, poverty, crime, drug abuse, and health problems. And it's for this reason that a strong marriage culture also serves the purpose of limited government since the government expands to fill the gaps and the marriage breaks down, the family breaks down. God designed a wonderful pattern for us to follow and it's clear in nature and it's good for kids. What's new about homosexual marriage is the detachment of the idea of marriage from the reality of biology. If gender is a self-determining reality and not a matter of actual reality, then marriage is a form merely of self-expression and is elastic. But marriage is in fact a pre-political institution, which is to say governments don't create or define it, but they recognize it, they harness its power, and they support it for the society's good. And lastly, logically, if we abandon the marital norm of male and female, we must recognize that there is no principle left to limit marriage to two people. The slope here actually exists, and it actually is slippery. It's not just a manipulative argument. Monogamish marriages, wedding leases, open marriages, polyamorous marriages, polygamous marriages, and thruples, thruples. These are all ideas being taken for a spin in real life and in time in the courts. All right, next question. Isn't that that fun? Um, So uh, how can homosexual marriage be wrong if it's not hurting anyone? I mean, come on, it's not hurting anyone. Um, And there's, uh, that's a good question. Assumption, if there's no distinct causal harm, then it's not hurting anyone and it's therefore okay. The short answer is, what do you mean by harm? There's a great video I'll link to for you guys after this in this document by Albert Moeller and Tim Keller and another one by uh, Russell Moore and J.D. Greer and uh, Vadi Bach. I'm discussing these questions. I got about 25 minutes on this specific topic. It's great stuff. If by harm we mean that someone is directly hurting me in some way, then we can usually say that my gay neighbors getting married doesn't harm me. But the harm we're talking about is tied to a moral ecology with generational and dynamic effects. With the loss of marriage as defined as a comprehensive union, several things follow, including the confusion of gender, 
bathrooms in California, minimizing fatherhood, it's a problem enough already, and the dissolving of marital norms. There will be no institution left that says fathers are necessary when gender is interchangeable. If you, have to, if you can say that a, a two moms is morally equivalent to a mom and a dad, you've just removed the need for a father. There's no moral, there's nothing to, there's, there's nothing to appeal to within our institutions to say, Dad, you need to stay home. Except, uh, except common sense and God's image in us. I have a friend uh, missing Carson's soccer game this morning. Um, uh, a dad on my son's soccer team, a scientist over at UNM, studies dirt all day. Guess where the dirt's from? From the Paseo Bridge. I love this. Okay, so he's sampling dirt. He's sampling dirt to make sure it's the right consistency, the right kind. Make sure he's, why? We're going to put cars and people on, these, on this, right? So you think, this square inch of dirt, what's the big deal? Come on. Come on. That all looks the same anyways. It's hard. You're going to put cement on these. But when pressure comes and stress comes and time comes, things break. You know this with buildings and Chile. Was it Chile? No, Haiti. Right? Third world earthquakes just ruin the place. Why? It's materials. It's code, right? Structures. So there, we, Christians say there's a moral structure to the universe. Everyone knows this. But there's a moral structure. We believe that marriage is cr- a crucial part. It's what the bricks are made of in the building. Next question. Are Christians on the wrong side of history? The assumption is, is that history always progresses. That's moving to a better place. The short answer is that uh, whose account of history are we talking about? Long answer, quote Yogi Berra. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. What do you think about that? Is that a good quote? Put that on your wall. The Christian's concern in any age is to be on the right side of truth. History has an appointed end, and that's a matter that's already settled. But just humanly speaking, it's also a cheap and manipulative strategy to speak of the right and wrong side of history because no one knows yet, and history shows movements of ideas that go bad as often as they go good. History does not always progress. Sometimes history regresses. It's a simple point, but it's easily lost on us. Um... I read one article talking about the statistics of the use of the history, uh, right side, wrong side of history argument. Like it's gone up like this in the last two years. Fascinating, huh? So it's being used. Don't miss it. One writer calls this the God is on our side argument minus God. Uh, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao all use this manipulative reasoning to lead their regimes into murder. We can't trust it, and we should not be intimidated by the right or wrong side of history argument. Don't think things are moving this way I'm going to be archaic. You might be on the right side of truth, even in the long view, even if you don't look fashionable in the rest of your lifetime. Stick with the word. Next question. Aren't laws allowing photographers and bakers to decline to shoot same-sex weddings akin to Jim Crow laws? I forgot to write an assumption down for this one, so we'll go to the short answer. Do you know what Jim Crow laws are? Do you know what legislation has been proposed? Now, I don't fault any of you for uh, even asking the question because of how confusing this was when it went down. But Jim Crow laws mandated the racial segregation of people at state and local levels across the country. Some examples include the segregation of restrooms, drinking fountains, transportation stations, and again, state-mandated nationwide. Different where you went around the country. but State-mandated. Jim Crow violated freedom of association, freedom of contract, freedom of religion by forcing business owners to comply with these laws. Laws intended to protect religious liberty are actually intended to protect against state coercion just like this. Laws like the one in Arizona is meant to protect those very freedoms that Jim Crow was restricting. That one perceptive writer wrote, should a Christian-owned advertising agency be forced to help create ads for legal prostitution rings in Las Vegas? And this is what we're talking about, religious liberty. At a basic level, how are we all going to live together? How are we all going to live together? I think those exceptions are important. Next question, is the civil rights, is this a civil rights issue of our generation? Is this the civil rights issue of our generation? The assumption is that sec- sexual orientation parallels race. Short answer, some would say so. I'd say it's not a civil rights issue. It is not. No doubt the logic of the civil rights movement has been applied to this issue. The problem with this comparison is that there isn't much of a comparison And the color of your skin is different than what you do with your body and feel in your heart, right? We have all kinds of desires that we don't 
become a special protected class for having. The civil rights, I think if this is the case, Robert P. George says that if uh, the state, if the government federalizes marriage uh, between man and man, woman and woman, same-sex marriage is morally equivalent, legally equivalent to to heterosexual marriage, 350 laws will be sitting there waiting for lawsuits to be dropped on anyone who would not treat the same fashion homosexual couples, I I don't even know what scenarios, uh, basically an exact parallel with how we handle race. Christians just say they're a completely different thing. Jews, Muslims, others. Um, So yeah, things are coming to a head. Color is concrete and genetic. Even if homosexuality were tied to our genes, that wouldn't make homosexual marriage therefore a civil right. Our many desires were born with that don't entitle us to certain things. In this case, the language of Mary has a long history that is tethered to biological complementarity and the orientation toward children. If we did grant homosexual desire was all that was needed to put someone in a protected class and so redefine marriage to accommodate their desire, where would it stop? Why not 10 people at a time? Untethered from biological realities, marriage has no meaning anymore. Finally, I should say that African American and Hispanics in California should be taken aback by the language of civil rights since they made up an extremely large and surprise voting block in Prop 8 vote back in 2008 in California. And they themselves were voting for Obama. Interesting. So the state that's most progressive helps put this president in office is also voting in large blocks of these demographics for Prop 8 because they're family people. So they're, you know, demographically democratic, but they're pro-family. So the, to co-opt civil rights language really is an offensive thing. It really should be. I'm, I, maybe I'm happy to use the word in this case. Next question. What about all our failed heterosexual marriages? The assumption is that a happy, stable gay marriage is better than an ha- unhappy, unstable traditional marriage. The short answer is that bad marriages are still marriages. Failed marriages were still marriages. This is like saying that because dad smokes, the kid can do crack. Dad should stop smoking or he's going to kill himself, but that still needs to, you know, the kid still shouldn't do crack. He has no license to take it a step further. The logic doesn't apply. And of course, there's grief over over the, the disintegrating marriage culture. And in a sense, it's also been overblown. Last question. Isn't it better for a child to be with a homosexual couple than on the street? So I've gotten this from a couple folks. Uh, pastor friend of mine called me, asked it. He was talking to like some nursing home about a number of things and they were doing a Q&A and this came up. So um, gal in a wheelchair asks him this. Uh, he's like, I didn't even know what to say. Uh, and so I'm trying to say here is that good, thoughtful, sweet people who love the Bible are wrestling with how to, how to talk and live and think and, and what's right here. So I'm going to give you my answer. The assumption is that there are only two options. I thought to try to think this through. I haven't found an answer anywhere on this, by the way. There's a finite number of orphans, this is an assumption, and a finite number of available families. The short answer is, should agencies have standards on income or years married either? You realize that agencies do that, right? They have standards, they have a number of standards to qualify you to adopt a child. Isn't it better for a child to be with a newlywed couple than on the street? <laughs> Christy and I adopted. And uh, so, yeah, you had, you know, one country we couldn't adopt from because he had to be married 10 years. Like, Are you serious? You know, we were married like seven years. So, uh, praise the Lord, he took us to Ethiopia. But, um, the question also assumes that these are only the only two options for some children. It assumes a fixed number of orphans and a fixed number of people available to care for orphans. And finally, our view of marriage has in view certain moral ecology with long-reaching generational effects. A stronger marriage culture means less, means more stable homes, less orphans, and more homes open to adoption and foster care as a result. We can't let go of marriage, folks. It's like compromising on the material you're making the bridge out of. It's a matter of time. 